Welcome to Crime on Caffeine. I'm your host, Erica. And I'm your host, Allison. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Today, we be sipping on a new coffee that I found on the interweb while I was searching for coffees. Well, I do that every week. But I was mm-hmm. searching for coffees for my stepmom for Christmas. Don't worry, she's not going to listen to this. She'll never hear about it. (laughs) But I did come across the Joshua Tree coffee, and I just fell in love with their cute little packaging. I'm a packaging whore, if anybody couldn't figure that out. So I obviously had to buy it for me and Erica. And I got us the Mellow Ethiopian blend. And it is just so light and beautiful and perfect for the morning. Perfect for me. Perfect for you. Yes, you're very. You light. knew this was like the only one that I would probably like. <laughs> I'm like, um, do you have a light roast for my little chicken? <laughs> um, I am apologizing in advance if I sound sick once again. Um, throat is a little mucusy. I swear, I don't have COVID. I'm feel like I'm sick like every episode now. We just like sleep with our window open, and it's like 10 degrees here, so it's probably why. Why do you do that? Because our building has, like, you can't turn the heat on, turn the AC on, control the thermostat. It's the whole building has the heat on and you can make it high or low and, like, really hot or, like, just kind of hot. I don't know about you guys, but I am one of those people who, like, it has to be cold in the room when I go to sleep. I, like, bundle up under the covers. If I am the least bit warm, I can't sleep. So Nate is like that, too. So that's why we sleep with the window open. But... We'll sleep with a fan on too sometimes, but you know, it makes me all... Oh my God. You're making yourself sick. Yeah, probably. But like, at least I'm not sweating in the middle of the night. I think I'd rather sweat. No, I can't. I can't do it. (laughs) But yeah, so thank you guys so much for 9,000 downloads. That's crazy. I can't believe we've only been doing this for like six months and (gasps) we're about... Oh, Gus said congrats. He said, hey, 10K. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for your support. It's honestly been so much fun doing this. Allison and I have been obsessed with true crime. So like, we're just happy that people actually listen so that we can keep putting episodes out for you guys because it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of work and a lot of fun. And if you guys don't know already, we are doing a 10K download giveaway. So once we get to $10,000, some lucky winner. $10,000. Did I say $10,000? Yeah, you did. Which remember, <laughs> we don't have. We don't want people to think that the 10K <laughs> giveaway is us giving away $10,000. I need to put that out there. Please I do need- not think that. We are not giving away $10,000. We're not even giving away $10. I don't even have $10. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Yeah, Christmas been bleeding me dry. Um, <laughs> but for real, it, I said $10,000 because the other day when we posted it, I literally texted Erica and I was like, somebody's going to think we're giving away $10,000. <laughs> but if they're a real fan, they know we ain't got that kind of money. No. Um, but yes, we are doing a giveaway. Once we hit 10K downloads, one lucky winner will be getting a secret surprise. All you have to do is post an episode on your story, post our podcast on your story, make sure to tag us. Every time you do it, it will put your name in the drawing to win a prize. And who doesn't love a prize? Yeah, you can repost any of our posts too. It's really easy to enter. Like literally all you have to do is promote us on your story, tag us so that we know and so that you can be entered for each post. You will be entered one entry and the winner will be chosen after the month is over. So the contest ends on New Year's Eve. And we love that. Also, I put it on our story the other day, but I'll have to do some kind of link for you guys. But we do have some merch available. So I will let you guys know what that link is. It can be on our website. It can be on our social medias. I will put it everywhere for you so that if you want to rep, rep the team, rep the squaw, you can. Because I know I do. And now my mother (laughs) does. (laughs) I really honestly wear that sweatshirt every day. I, it's a problem. Every day I wear it. <laughs> I honestly like don't leave my apartment, so it's fine. That's okay. Max had his on the other day, though, and it was really cute. Aww. He was in the kitchen, and I was like, do a spin. Do a spin. Babe. Do a spin. Let me see it all. Nate packed his when we went home for Thanksgiving, so we were matching. 
Ah, that I is didn't even know I opened his suitcase and I was like, oh, he's, he loves the squaw. He does. I'm also traveling this coming week for my birthday. Shouts out me. Happy birthday. Um, but <laughs> I'm going to be wearing my sweatshirt all over the city of New York. So if you find me, say hello. I'm about to plaster New York with crime on caffeine stickers. So everybody be aware. <laughs> so I'm doing an unsolved case this week. Shocking. No. I know. Shocking. And I am in the process of working on something kind of big. <gasps> what? And it's more of like a theory or a conspiracy theory or like a work in progress case that isn't confirmed to be a case, but probably could be a case. But I don't know. What it's, are you saying right now? <laughs> it's, I'm just, I'm just trying to excite people. I'm excited. To come. I'm working on something big and I hope it goes really well and I don't get angry and scrap it because that happens a lot, but we'll see. We have done that a few times. Yeah. I, before writing the case that I'm doing today, I started like three other cases and scrapped them all. It was a struggle. We're, one day we're just going to have to do um, <laughs> like the lost cases. Of <laughs> Without further ado, here we have the West Mesa murders. I've never heard of this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> I'm going to set the scene for you. Okay, let's hear it. February 2nd, 2009, a woman named Christine Ross is on a walk with her dog, Ruka, on the west side of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Beautiful day. I don't even know if it was a beautiful day, but I assume it was because they were outside. They were walking the trail, and Ruka discovers a bone. At first, Christine couldn't really tell what it was, if it was like an animal or something else. Didn't really know what to do with it, so she, like, took a picture of it and texted it to her sister because she was like, I don't really know. And her sister is a nurse, and she was like, yeah, that's a human bone. So immediately, Christine contacted the police. Some sources say it was a femur. Others say it was a rib bone. But the police obviously immediately went to the scene and started digging around. They spent the next few weeks searching 92 acres of land to uncover the remains of 11 victims and it took them a year to identify each one let's talk about why this took so long yeah that's crazy yeah around the time the girls went missing between like 2003 2005 so it was like the first half of the decade this area was growing so fast in the 90s they had two major highways built and they were planning on doing like a ton of building but the 2008 housing collapse halted this so mm. They have acres and acres of land that were bought and ready to be built into residence and commercial buildings and everything like the ground was dug up, whatnot, but the building couldn't start because of the housing collapse. So, so many of these lots and homes had been prepped and the land had been dug and messed up. And while some of the bones managed to stay perfectly intact, um, some were found like 15 feet below ground. Um, others were just scattered around from all of the construction work being done and scavenged by animals. So they were physically piecing together a puzzle, but some of the pieces were ripped or chewed or so they couldn't fit. So it was so, so hard for the detectives and the Emmys to figure out who these victims were and even getting a final count for how many of them there were. So that's why it took a year to identify all of them, but there were 11 12, depending on what you can consider a victim, but we'll get to that. They did assume that because all the bodies were in the same place, that this was probably the work of just one killer alone who was using this region as his dumping ground. So a week after this discovery, the police decided to inform the public. And at this point, they identified their first victim. Let's just talk about the victims. The first victim that they were able to identify was Victoria Chavez. She was a 26-year-old mother of two who was a sex worker and an avid drug user. She disappeared in 2004 after being in and out of jail multiple times. She had a probation officer who tried to keep her from, you know, getting back into drugs and going back into jail, but no luck. And her mother officially reported her missing in 2005. She was buried 18 inches below ground with no clothes, no belongings, only to be identified by dental records. And this was the tough part for investigators because they were able to guess that she'd been killed sometime in 2004, but her body was so badly decomposed. It had been five years later. So 
they struggled to find an exact cause of death. And this is the case for every single victim. To this day, they still just say that the cause of death for these girls was homicidal violence. Like, they have no exact cause of the homicide. That's ridiculous. I know I did mention that, you know, she was involved in sex work and she was a drug abuser. And I just wanted to bring up that for serial killers, like, especially our serial killers who are more reserved and under the radar, not our narcissistic serial killers like BTK and Ted Bundy and all them, this is their ideal victim. They target sex workers, drug addicts, homeless, because their disappearances are more often than not unnoticed just because they're transient and a lot of these women stopped really associating with their loved ones. So, you know, their loved ones don't hear from them. They don't know that they're missing, obviously, because they don't even know where they are in the first place. Or their disappearances will just go unnoticed for a really long time, like Victoria's. Her family didn't notice until 2005. And unfortunately, their cases, if they are reported, are just often looked at as they're not looked at as thoroughly as somebody else's, and they're just not as often solved. Police kind of don't take these cases as seriously um, just because of the sex work and because of the drugs. A lot of times they say that these people just didn't want to be found or like they're off doing drugs somewhere or this and that. So it's just really unfortunate, but that is why these killers do target them because it's just the perfect opportunity and they think nobody cares and nobody's going to notice. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're going to discover that almost all of the victims match the same description. So a few weeks later, they were able to piece together more bodies, one being 22-year-old Michelle Valdez, who was four months pregnant at the time of her murder. So that's why I said... 11, maybe 12 victims, if you consider the baby a victim as well. Mm -hmm. And it was so early on in her pregnancy, she might not have even known that she was pregnant. Um, but she was the eighth set of bones to be found and the second to be identified, like I said. And she came from a family of three sisters with two very loving parents. And she started to get kind of wild when she was a teenager. So it was just like really hard on her parents and really tough for them to deal with her and discipline her. And it just caused them a lot of stress. Mm hmm when she was a young teenager, she gave birth to a daughter. And then a few years later, she gave birth to a son and she loved her children so much, but she realized that with the lifestyle that she was living, it would make it really hard for her to be the mother that she wanted to be. And she just fell into a world of sex work and drug abuse, but her parents vouched that she was still the same Michelle. They said she was a very fun, loving girl. She always had a smile on her face and she would just brighten up a room with her bubbly personality. Everybody has their faults and hers was drugs, but she was still a human being. She was a good sister. She always looked out for her sisters and she was a mom who cared about her kids' accomplishments. Drug addiction certainly wasn't the lifestyle she wanted. She wanted help, but she didn't have money or insurance, so it was very hard for her to get it. Which is another thing about these cases that are so sad is because nobody wants to be doing these things. And always like, hmm, I, I mean, I guess some people, but like these people turn to these habits, these activities, these careers, whatever you want to call them, because they felt like they had no other choice. So mm -hmm. just for you to like consider them not people because of those decisions is just shitty. Yeah. A lot of the times people go that route because, you know, they have families they really need to support and, you know, there might not be, they couldn't go to school or they didn't have the means to do certain things to get a career. A hundred percent. So it's not fair. It's not fair. A hundred percent. And like she had two kids, you know, she needed money right away. She couldn't like mm -hmm. waste time trying to find a job and doing this and that. And addiction is a disease. So obviously that's another tough part of it too. Yeah. But her father reported her missing in February of 05. He told police about her lifestyle, which they believed was the reason for her disappearance, which is annoying. But we, we know that that's we know. a pattern. So the next victim to be identified was Cinnamon Elks. She was a mother of two who unfortunately also struggled with drug addiction. She was arrested 19 times for prostitution and 12 times for possession. Her last arrest was in July of 2004, and after that, she wasn't seen again. And when she, just like the other victims, stopped coming around her family, because, you know, they would contact their families every once in a while for financial support, but she stopped coming around, and that's when her family started to worry. And a month after her last arrest, so in August of 2004, her mom reported her missing. 
And she said that no matter what was happening in Cinnamon's life or like where she was, what she was doing, she would always call her mother on her birthday. She never missed it. And so when her mother, Diana, didn't hear from her, she knew immediately that something was wrong. And even though they reported her missing to the police, they wouldn't take it seriously. And they said that adult daughters had the right to cut off contact with whomever they choose, including parents, and that they couldn't even prove she was missing. And it wasn't until December that they were finally allowed to file a police report. So this was four months after they realized she was missing. That's not how that goes. Sadly, it is. It is how it goes. Four months. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. I'm good and pissed off now. It's tough when it's an adult. And obviously just the fact that her family didn't ever see her and they obviously explained her lifestyle to the police. That's just how they're going to react. I know. But four months is aggressive. Very aggressive. But Cinnamon was the oldest of the victims found at 32 years old. And Diana confirmed that Cinnamon actually sort of knew and was like was friends with um, the first couple of victims who were identified who also happened to know each other. So all these victims ran in similar circles, which makes sense because they were involved in the same things in the same area. And it wasn't much longer until police would identify the fourth victim, another person who was familiar with the previous ones. So the fourth victim that they were able to identify was 19-year-old Julie Nieto. She was born in Albuquerque, and she had a son in her earlier teen years, and she didn't start to experiment with drugs until she had turned 19, so literally the year that she went missing. But the experimentation that she had quickly turned into addiction, and her family last saw her in August 2004, which was like around the same time that Diana reported Cinnamon missing. And like the other girls, just because of her involvement with drugs and sex work, her case is not taken seriously. And the disappearance was very, very hard on her family. Julie's sister, they were very close. Her name was Valerie. They were best friends. And her sister ended up overdosing in a motel room. And their family just believes that, you know, like it had to do with her being depressed and just dealing with the loss of her sister. It was really hard on her. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. They just said that she was really depressed during the time. She was really struggling. So that's really fucking sad. Yeah. The snowball effect of this. So bad. Cinnamon's mother had remembered rumors from before Cinnamon disappeared. She said that Cinnamon and Cinnamon's friends were saying that there was a dirty cop killing prostitutes and chopping their heads off and burying them in the West Mesa. And if I'm saying Mesa or Mesa or whatever wrong, my fellow New Mexicans, just call me out. It's okay. Don't leave us a bad review, but like you can tell me I won't be upset. Just let us know. (laughs) But Diana said that in the years her daughter was missing that she would receive really weird phone calls from like anonymous people telling her that this same thing happened to her daughter. And, you know, she was killed by a dirty cop and she reported the calls to the police. But of course, they didn't do anything. The 22-year-old victim, the one that was four months pregnant, Michelle Valdez, her mom said that she heard some of the same rumors, and she knew her daughter was friends with Cinnamon, and she heard rumors that the girls were stabbed and buried in the West Mesa, and she said that before the bones were found, Michelle's sister got a phone call from one of Michelle's friends offering her condolences because she heard Michelle had been stabbed and, quote, thrown out somewhere. So, like, this was before the bones were even discovered. Oh, my God. Yeah. But none of this helped. Law enforcement did not give a shit. (laughs) They were in no hurry to solve this case until now. But like I was saying, the first four victims that were identified all ran in the same social circle. They all went missing within about six months of each other between 2004 and 2005. So police began to investigate further into these girls' lives, you know, who they spoke with, who they spent time with before they went missing. Um, But this obviously wasn't easy, especially five years later. They weren't faces who stayed in one place for too long. Most of the people they would have known before they went missing were, you know, they were transient. So they were somewhere else or they had died from drug abuse or something else, violence, whatever. Or, you know, they just didn't want to talk to cops because they were doing illegal things. True. So it was really hard for them to get any information about these women. They began to look at missing persons files of sex workers dating all the way back to the 80s. And they had this whole list of women that they thought these women have to be 
the people on this list. Like some of them have to be these girls. Mm -hmm. The fifth body to be identified was that of Veronica Romero. She was a 28 year old mother of five who was last seen in February of 2004 getting into a white pickup truck around the area that the bones are found. So now we kind of have something to go off of. Someone actually saw her getting into a white pickup truck. Okay. So she was reported a few weeks later into February. And then the next body that was identified was that of Monica Candelaria. She was a 21-year-old mom who was last seen in the late spring of 2003. Same extracurriculars as the other victims. She was even involved with some gangs in the area, and her parents heard a rumor that she had been killed and buried in that area. So the next victim, the seventh victim to be identified, was 28-year-old Doreen Marquez. She was a mother of two who grew up a little bit differently than the others. Like, she lived a perfectly stable, very affluent life. Um, She was super involved in her kids' lives. And then later in life, before the time of her disappearance, obviously, her boyfriend went to jail and they broke up and she just went off the deep end. She was heartbroken. She started doing drugs and she became addicted to heroin. Oh, no. Yeah. So, you know, we have these women still couldn't determine the cause of death from anyone, anything. They had no witnesses, no DNA, literally nothing to go off of other than victimology. But what they did have was photos. They were photos of women, some who they thought might be some of the victims, but they didn't say how they got those photos. And they released them to the public. They immediately found that two of them were alive and then one of them had died of natural causes. But the other ones, they still didn't know who they were. So some of them in the photos looked unconscious and they looked very similar to the victims. So like they didn't say how they got these photos or anything. They just said some of the girls in these photos might be these victims. Like let's try and connect it, see if anyone says anything. They also obtained a search warrant for two homes that belonged to photographer Ron Irwin. They gathered hundreds of pieces of evidence from his homes and his businesses, but there was unfortunately nothing that tied him to the photos of the victims. And at this point, you know, they'd identified seven women. They were still trying to figure out the identities of the four women that were left, and the news was now national. There were a few suspects that police were trying to connect, but still nothing was really coming up. They had no evidence anywhere that they could link someone to. And they also didn't want to publicly come out and say like, hey, this is the work of a serial killer. So they weren't really telling the public a lot, but they did want it to be known nationally at this point. In the summer, the FBI became super hands-on with the case and they ended up developing a task force and... Then at this point, they were very stumped on one identity that was just not like the rest of the victims. One of the victims that they identified was an African-American woman who looked to be a lot younger than the others. And they didn't think that she was from Albuquerque. And it wouldn't be until November of 2009 that they were able to match the remains to Solania Edwards. And this girl lived a very troubled life. So she was born in Texas. She didn't know her father and she was separated from her mom at the age of five after she went to prison. And so Solania and her seven siblings were put into the foster system and they were split up. And so like she didn't even live in New Mexico. She actually lived with her foster parents in Oklahoma. But in August of 2003, she ran away from her foster home and was reported missing after. And she was only 15. So she was one of the youngest victims, and clearly didn't match the profile at all. So I don't know what happened there. She must have just been a victim of opportunity. Like, I don't think that the killer would have sought her out necessarily. Mm -hmm. Maybe just like a wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. But the next victim to be identified was Virginia Cloven, and she lived with her family outside of Albuquerque, And she had a really hard time. So in high school, one of her brothers was murdered and she could not deal with it. So a few days after she ended up running away from home and so did her other brother. And so she lived with her boyfriend in Albuquerque and he ended up getting hit by a car and was in a coma. So this poor girl, she was now homeless and she was living on the streets of Albuquerque, just trying to survive on her own. And eventually just fell into the same patterns as the other girls. She distanced herself from her family and friends, fell into sex work, fell into drug abuse, in and out of jail for several different charges. And then in June of 2004, she called her parents to tell them 
she had a new boyfriend. He was getting out of jail. They were getting married. And like, she just seemed like super excited and super happy. And this was the last time her parents would ever hear from her. And they finally reported her missing in October. So victim number 10 that was identified was Evelyn Salazar. She was a mother of two. And while she did have a history of sex work and drug abuse, her disappearance was still very different from the others in the sense that she was not alone at the time of her disappearance. In March 2004, 25-year-old Evelyn went to the park with her 15-year-old cousin, Jamie Barela. And Jamie did not have the same history as the other victims. She was the only one who was not involved with drugs of any kind, no history of sex work, nothing. Like, she literally was just with her cousin. And it's not even known if they made it to the park. They were never seen from or heard from again, obviously, until they were identified as being the victims. And Jamie wasn't identified until January of 2010, and she was the last person that had been identified, and there was still no answer as to what happened. This is crazy. So crazy. Like, all of a sudden, a dog finds one bone, then all of a sudden you've got 11 victims from one person from five years ago, and you have no idea. I'm shook. So here is what they had to work with. The killer struck between spring of 03, spring of 05, primarily targeted Latina women with a history of sex work and drug abuse, obviously, probably because their disappearance would go unnoticed. They didn't discriminate, though, because of that one African-American victim. Uh, they found their victims all in the same area. They seemed to prefer younger women, um, as the oldest victim was only 32. All victims were buried with no clothes or any personal belongings, you're able to assume it's possible that they were choked or strangled or suffocated, buried alive, something, because there were no stab wounds, no bullet holes, anything like that. Over time, police looked at several men, but not all of them were even considered full-on suspects, and it was the lack of actual evidence was just, they had nothing. They looked into Fred Reynolds, who was a pimp who worked in the area, and he had his own escort service at one point. He had been arrested multiple times for promoting prostitution. In the years leading up to the discovery of the remains, so like 2008, he apparently had been looking for some of the victims, and he had photos of them on him, and he was telling people that he was a former heroin addict who just wanted to help these women live a better life. And he hadn't heard from them in a while. He just wanted to know if they were okay. Like, he knew them, whatever. He ended up dying in January of 2009 from natural causes. So, like, just one month before all of these bones were discovered. And there were photos of some of the victims found at his home. But there, were no, there was no physical evidence linking Reynolds to their deaths. But mm. he was actually cleared just because... I mean, the only reason he had photos of these victims was because he knew them, and people who knew both Reynolds and the victims said that there was no way he'd be responsible. Like, he was actually being dead serious. He actually really cared about helping these people. So, like, he was mm -hmm. actually a good guy, apparently. So, if that's true, that makes me sad that he passed. Yeah. So, dead end right there. Then we have Lorenzo Montoya, who lived less than two miles from the burial site. He frequented the area a lot and was first arrested for charges relating to prostitution in 98. He was arrested again the following year as police caught him trying to rape and strangle a prostitute with no plan on paying her. Four years later, the same thing happened, but, you know, the violence didn't just stem from random prostitutes. His former girlfriend actually filed a domestic violence claim stating that he repeatedly beat her and did, quote, gross things to her. But she didn't detail what those things were in the documents. She did state that he threatened to kill her and bury her. Wow. So in 2006, he had a prostitute come over to his house and he strangled her to death. I think the prostitute's boyfriend, like, obviously followed her to make sure she, she was safe. And so he saw what happened and he shot Montoya and killed him. So after searching his home, police found like a bunch of sex tapes and things like that. But there was one video in particular that was found on his camera that after a while, it just goes black, but you can still hear things. You can hear like voices, you can hear sounds. And people theorize that this video is the sounds and everything. Of him killing somebody? Well, 
preparing the body to be buried. <gasps> so like he had already done the killing. People think that it sounds like him zipping someone up into a bag or like putting them in a trash bag or something and then like putting duct tape. We'll play the part of the sound. But in 2016, the police were looking for two of the prostitutes that were in these videos, but I don't think anything came of that. So, yeah, he definitely sounds sketchy. Mm -hmm. Sucks that he's there's dead. nothing to go off of. Oh, the other weird thing is that after he died, the killing stopped. Shut up. Yeah. Oh, well, come on. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. So then let's talk about Scott Lee Kimball, which you might have heard of him because he actually is a famous serial killer. Yes. In 2002, he was released from prison after he convinced the FBI to allow him to work with them as an informant. So over the next two years, he killed four people between 2003 and 2004, but more than likely had a lot more victims, possibly up to 21. In 2010, police began investigating him because he had jobs in that area in the years between 2002 and 2005, and then obviously his history of violence. But he denies having any ties to the case. There's never been anything linking him to any of the victims. I think it was just like, hey, here's a possibility. We have nothing to go off of, so let's see if this can stick. Now, let's talk about Joseph Blea. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his last name. I apologize. I... <laughs> So I went into this thinking I knew how to pronounce these people's names. I'm really sorry, guys. But the biggest break came into... I'm going to say break loosely. But the biggest break came in 2014 when police were able to link DNA to a man that was responsible for the rape of a 13-year-old girl from Albuquerque. So Joseph Bleo was convicted of the rape the following year. He was believed to have been preying on girls from McKinley Middle School in the 80s. And he was given the nickname the mid-school rapist. And that same year that he was convicted, he was suspected of killing a sex worker because his DNA was found on her dead body after it was left on a curve in 1985. Actually, police already began looking into him just a week after the first bone was discovered. So, like, this is five years before he's getting in trouble for this other case. They were looking at him long before it was found that he was the mid-school rapist. So his first wife had contacted police and told them that they should look into him. How, how to her? Right? Right now he's serving 90 years for four sexual assault cases. He was also accused of raping a 14-year-old girl with a screwdriver. <gasps> um, oh my God. Police knew him very well. Between 1990 and the discovery of the remains, so over, like, almost a 20-year period, police had encountered him 130 times. Many of those encounters related to prostitution and drugs, and they were just in the areas where the victims often spent their time. So in the weeks after the remains were discovered, they placed surveillance on him. They had a report from the past of him exposing himself to a prostitute. And then when his vehicle was searched, there was rope and electrical tape. So it's, you know, what were you planning on doing, buddy? Yeah. So they surveyed him for four days and the entire time he was stalking prostitutes and like following them around. Great. In, in the same area. Great. Yeah. So eight months into this entire investigation, they searched his home and they found women's jewelry and underwear that did not belong to the women in his house. Um, his wife at the time, Cheryl, explained that he liked to wear them when they had sex. No. And she said that on numerous occasions, she and her daughter just found the random, like, jewelry and underwear throughout the home and, like, hidden in the shed. <clears throat> like, okay, sis, keep telling yourself that, but something's going on here. Yeah, no, that's just... <clears throat> but some of the families of the victims noticed that their daughter's jewelry had been missing. Oh, interesting. God. <laughs> he also allegedly discussed these murders to others. This case, he allegedly told a former cellmate that he knew the victims and that he often paid for services from them. He spoke very poorly of them and called them trashy. Oh, they're trashy. Come on. We'll we'll talk about serial killers and their attitudes towards prostitutes. But one of the characteristics is that they 
the way that he's speaking about him is the way that they feel about them. They just think that they're trash, they're filth, they're the scum of the earth. They want to get rid of them. So the fact that he's speaking about them in this way is very telling. Yeah. But you have to remember that literally all of this evidence is totally circumstantial. But there was one thing that they found that they thought might be able to tie him to the victims. So next to the remains of Virginia Cloven, there was a tag for a spearmint juniper plant. And this plant was traced back to a nursery in California that sends trees to Albuquerque. And they looked at his business records that showed that he often purchased trees from nurseries in California. But it was never stated if this was linked to him or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just going to assume that it wasn't because I feel like something would have happened. Yeah. This is what I hate about unsolved cases is that they just kind of like drop off right here. And I don't know how to end them because this case is a bust. It's unsolved. They have no idea what happened. They have no idea who could have been involved. They have no witnesses. They have no DNA. They don't even have a cause of death. Great. So to this day, it is still unsolved. We have no idea what the hell happened. And yeah. And that's why I don't like them. I just can't stand this. Drives me nuts. How do you do this? I don't know. <laughs> I, I just do. I live for the thrill of it. I just do. But there are a lot of serial killers who chose prostitutes as their victims. The Green River Killer. Yeah. Gary Ridgway. Um he said, I picked prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes. I also picked them because they're easy to pick up without being noticed. I knew that they would not be reported missing. I picked them because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. Jack the Ripper killed prostitutes as well. The Ohio Truck Stop Killer. The Yorkshire Ripper, a.k.a. Peter Sutcliffe. Sam Little, who killed like 93 people. The Long Island serial killer and the Denver prostitute killer killed 17. Robert Hansen, the butcher baker from Alaska. So he was a serial killer who killed prostitutes. And one of the kind of like we just talked about with Gary Ridgway, these killers think that prostitutes are what they call unrapeable. Um, just basically saying like they deserve it, what they do to them, like they deserve it all. And a lot of the serial killers who kill them are categorized as angels of death. Like Robert Hansen would be considered an angel of death because of the reasons why he did it, killed prostitutes. He said that they were evil and angels of death think that they're like cleaning the world, cleaning the earth or ridding the earth. Yeah. So it, they think it's like their job and they think they're doing something good by like ridding the earth of this filth when in reality, obviously they're not. That's how Robert Hansen felt. And that's why he killed prostitutes. He spoke of them the same way that Joseph Blea spoke of them. So obviously these men have a real hatred of women and it's very sad and it's very scary because 22% of serial murder victims between 1970 and 2009 were prostitutes. And over the last decade, that number has more than doubled to 43%. So, which is really sad because you would think that we would be getting better at investigating and like keeping this from happening but it's almost like we're getting worse and i feel like sex work is a lot more accepted nowadays than it was back then too so that i just feel like that makes it 10 times worse like doesn't really make sense to me but yeah those are the west mess of murders and i personally don't think that they'll ever be solved i just like don't think they have a strong enough suspect half of their suspect pool is dead true but yeah that's all thank you guys so much for listening make sure you follow us on spotify make sure you subscribe on apple Podcasts so you know as soon as we release episodes it's every wednesday but that'll just make sure that you are always on top of the most recent episodes and that they're in your library ready to go ready for you to listen to and leave us a review yes and I pretty much think she said everything. Just don't forget to enter that giveaway so that maybe you could be the lucky winner. You can post any of our episodes to your story, screenshot, share it directly from whatever listening platform. You can share any of our posts to your stories, whatever you want. Just promote us in some way, shape, or form, and each post will be entered. Exactly. We would really appreciate it because we are trying to... Hit that 10K downloads before Christmas. You know what Erica says. All we want for Christmas is 10K. 
But with that being said, thank you guys so much for continuing to support us. Again, yes, thank you so much for listening. We will catch up with you guys next week. Bye.